Hello, everyone. Welcome to the State of Human Rights 2020 Reflections and Lessons Learned. I am Veronica Lewin, Director of Communications at the FXD Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. Thank you all for joining us today. One housekeeping item before we get started. Our speakers will be taking questions at the end of this event. For those watching on Zoom, please leave your questions in the Q&A box. If you are joining us on Facebook Live, please leave your question in the comment box. Now, we will start our event with a keynote address from Dr. Mary T. Bassett. Dr. Bassett has dedicated her career to advancing health equity. She is currently the director of the FXB Center and the FXB Professor of the Practice of Health and Human Rights at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Prior to joining the FXB Center, she served as New York City's Commissioner of Health from 2014 to 2018. You can learn more about Dr. Bassett by visiting our webpage. A link will soon be available in the chat. And with that, Dr. Bassett, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. It's really a pleasure to be with you today and I'm delighted to be part of the FXB Center's inaugural State of Human Rights event. When we look back at the past year, there is a lot to reflect upon. 2020 was truly a year unlike anything that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. Uh, it was a year that tested us as a society, as societies around the globe. And it's fair to ask the question, how did we fare? While there were some successes overall, I think we have to admit that we failed to meet the moment. It was just over a year ago that the first COVID-19 case was confirmed in the United States. And a month later, we had the first death reported here. A couple of weeks after that, the world essentially came to a halt. Governments around the globe ordered sweeping shutdowns, uh, some without a single case having been diagnosed. Travel was restricted. Officials scrambled to stop the spread of this highly contagious virus and to contain the terrible economic consequences of the response. While we faced a common challenge, a novel coronavirus, that the effects of the pandemic have not been felt equally across the globe and within our countries. In an early March 2020 op-ed, which seems a lifetime ago, I wrote with my colleague at the FXB Center, Dr. Natalia Linos, uh, that epidemics track along the fissures of our society, that they reinforce and reveal structural inequities in our society. And we urge governments and policymakers to take swift action to protect the most vulnerable among us from unnecessary illness and death. And before long, these vast inequities were uncovered for all to see. Let me talk about the United States. As soon as the data were available, and we did have to wait, we saw that Black, Latinx, and Indigenous Americans were getting infected and dying at higher rates than white Americans. When adjusted for age, the COVID-19 death rates were more than two to three times higher for the Black, Latino, and Native American population than for white Americans. And this, of course, is not because the people in these communities are at biologically higher risk of contracting the virus. This is a result of a way in which society has built itself, decisions that we've made that intentionally and consistently have kept people who are not white at disadvantage and as a consequence harmed all of us. So while some of us, and I was among them, you see me now uh, working from my home, many black, brown and indigenous people were forced to protect their livelihoods at the expense of their health. And the snappy slogan, stay home, save lives, didn't apply to the people stocking our grocery store shelves or food service workers or other low wage workers in fields that were deemed essential. Our society, societal shortcomings were also on display during a swath of police brutality. In 2020, we lost Richard Brooks, Breonna Taylor, Daniel Prude, George Floyd, 
and so many others at the hands of police. These murders and the lack of appropriate justice led to a summer in our part of the world of social justice protests that were truly unprecedented in their scale and calls to defund the police. In the midst of the pandemic, we also learned that an ICE detention center in Georgia had, uh, what, had um, forced sterilization procedures on immigrant women and had stripped them of their right to have a family on their own terms. I, I can't really remember a time in recent memory when so many injustices were brought to light or that there was such a robust public response to proclaiming that these injustices were not uh, ones that we would withstand. On top of that, we have seen democracy itself under attack in the United States. The November 2020 election brought a host of new challenges. Uh, we have long endured voter suppression efforts such as limiting the number of polling sites so that it's harder to find a place to vote, removing mailboxes, shutdown of the mail to keep people from receiving their ballots and exercising their right to vote in one of the most consequential elections in US history. But uh, the majority overcame these efforts and we have witnessed a vote against white supremacy, callous indifference and xenophobia. And now the real work will begin. The peaceful transfer of power that we've taken for granted was flouted. The outgoing president continuously and baselessly challenged the election results, refused to concede and incited a deadly insurrection at the US Capitol uh, just three weeks ago. So while there's a new administration in the White House, uh, the societal conditions that led to the election of Donald Trump remain, and we have to remain vigilant and hold people accountable to protect democracy in the years ahead. The last year was a challenging one for the world and for my own country, the United States, uh, but there have been some bright spots. You're seeing a photograph of one of our bright spots right now. And a positive outcome of 2020 was a new and collective understanding that our world must be better. It must be more just for those who currently live here and for the future generations to whom we owe our strongest efforts. I am heartened <clears throat> by the movement for racial justice and believe that the power of organizing will lead to lasting change. The rapid development and of a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine was also a tremendous gain for the health of the world. So as I conclude my reflection, above all, 2020 was a year of loss. I think nearly all of us have been touched by the lethal impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic personally, and on a global scale, uh, the loss of life as we knew it, and the loss of 2.1 million people from coronavirus. And we hope also that we have lost the status quo that brought us to this moment. Uh, the state of human rights is precarious, but I'm very hopeful for the year ahead. As we enter the second year of the pandemic, the vaccine brings new promise, but we have to make sure that access to this vaccine is equitable, or we will continue to see the inequities in its impact. And I hope and I am confident that the Biden administration will uh, continue to address this issue. And of course, uh, lurking behind all of this, and Part of the reason that we're confronting new pathogens is the climate crisis, which continues to threaten the right to life, the right to water and sanitation, and much more. And urgent action is needed. And we also must begin to address the longstanding health and wealth gaps in a meaningful way. 
the health inequities that we see in Black America can be traced all the way back to 1619 when the first Africans were captured from Africa and brought to the colony then of Jamestown. That was in 1619, uh, now over 400 years ago. And reparations as a way of offsetting this long and painful history uh, and addressing the enormous persistent wealth gap between Black Americans and their uh, white counterparts is something that we all have an obligation to discuss and to work towards. So as I close my remarks, um, I wanted to mention again that a return to the pre-conditions uh, pre-COVID, a return to the status quo that we viewed as normal uh, can no longer be considered normal. We need to take this opportunity to look at how we structured our society, hold decision makers accountable, and finally build a society that works for all. That's our goal. So as I close, I want to uh, speak the words of uh, the National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman. Uh, who, it, who made us all so proud with her poise and her courage as she read aloud at the US presidential inauguration just last week. She said, we will not march back to what was, but we'll move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce, and free. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bassett. Before I introduce our special guest, I'd like to remind the audience that we will be taking questions at the end of this program. Please be sure to leave your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom or as a comment for those watching on Facebook. Next, we will have our roundtable discussion with Dr. Bassett and our special guest, Dr. Tuling Moko Kang. At its 44th session in July 2020, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed Dr. Moko Kang as Special Rapporteur on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Dr. Moko Kang is a medical doctor with expertise advocating for universal health access, HIV care, youth-friendly services, and family planning. Dr. Moko Kang's full bio is now available in the chat. Dr. Mofo King, we are so delighted you could join us today. And next, we will kick off the roundtable discussion. Dr. Bassett, I will turn it back to you to ask the first question in our roundtable discussion. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I, I want to uh, thank Dr. Mofo King for joining us. I think you must be in South Africa. Is that is that right? I'm yeah. in Johannesburg. Yes. And congratulate <laughs> you on your appointment as a special rapporteur. Uh, on the right to health. The right to health was really the founding principle of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights uh, that was founded now over 25 years ago. Um, so I um, have talked a lot about COVID-19 and of course it's on all of our minds, but I, I thought I would start out by asking you a question that refers to work that you've done that um, has preceded the impact of COVID-19. Of course, all of those challenges still remain and, uh, and some of them are really relevant to how we've been able to respond to COVID-19, namely the right to universal health care. And you've long advocated for universal health ac access, for universal HIV care, for youth-friendly services and advocated against gender-based violence. So, why don't you talk with us a little bit about the successes that you've had, the challenges you've faced, and how you think we can move to overcome these challenges. Thank you so much, um, Mary. I mean, it's quite a privilege for me to join you for this session. Um, I feel thoroughly spoiled because I've been following your work for many, many years. Um, and just to say thank you for for the path um, that we now follow. 
And, you know, a lot of the time when, when people, you know, get to understand the work that I do as a medical doctor, the question is why? Why are you an activist? Why are you concerned, right, mm -hmm. about the politics of health? And really, it's just simple for me. You know, this, this, this is a fight for my own survival. The, this advocacy that I do, I'm the first beneficiary of it. And for those who look like me, who sound like me, who come from the same spaces where I come from, um, know firsthand that it has taken a series of miracles to not only finish high school, but you get a tertiary education and now be in a position where you could be appointed as a UN special repertoire. For many of us, the audacity to even dream is not even in, in the realm of our existence. And so I know that um, the health determinants are important, that the right to health is interlinked to many other rights, such as you know, freedom and security, such as you know, respect and dignity and bodily autonomy. And it's very important um, as, as a clinician, as a medical doctor, especially as a younger doctor, to start advocating for patients' rights and, and wanting to change the context of their illness because it wasn't enough for me to just put a band aid right over a wound. I knew that there were causes of ill health and disease um, that went beyond just individual genetic predisposition. So issues like racism, colonialism, I, you know, have impacted South Africa um, and yeah. the rural places that I come from. And that's what has influenced me to become the person that I am today. You know that I, I lived and, and worked in Zimbabwe for many years and uh, was there during, uh, during the time that HIV first declared itself. And it was impossible um, to live in Southern Africa and not understand the way in which uh, the society was structured uh, uh, had an impact on its vulnerability to what um, has been uh, one of the worst uh, AIDS epidemics in the world. Uh, South Africa, of course, has more people living with HIV. Probably you still do. Um, uh, and as new incidences of, of adolescent girls, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, all of us were watching in horror, you know, just mm. a few weeks ago with what was happening um, at the Capitol yeah. in Washington, DC. Uh, you know, a lot of us, of course, you know, with the election coming, you know, you could see the, the messaging, right, that was coming through and, and the type of politics, right, that were engulfing the mm -hmm. US. And I was gonna know from you, as much as many of us were surprised, maybe some were shocked mm -hmm. at what was happening. As someone who has been studying the history of America, looking at issues of white supremacy, right, and racism, mm -hmm. can you, share with us um, how this country got to this point, because often America is lauded, right, as a beacon of democracy. And, 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 and yet what we saw on television was something far from that. Yeah, well, thank you for that question. I, 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 I agree with you. I, I think that many people uh, somehow thought of the United States as a country that didn't have its own human rights issues to deal with. And of course, that's not, has not been true. Uh, but the United States is a very powerful country. And in that regard, it's been able to shape the narrative around human rights in, in many ways. Uh, of course, everybody was shocked uh, at the, um, that this actually happened, that there were hordes of people banging on glass, breaking windows, pouring into the Capitol, wandering around, putting their feet up on the desks, finding their way to offices oh. that should have been, um, you know, that it seems unlikely that, um, that they would have found if they hadn't done some advanced reconnaissance. So uh, there was, you know, evidence that has continued to emerge that, that that there were there was substantial advance planning. There were mm -hmm. veterans there uh, of the U.S. military. Um, uh, so all of this uh, is extremely shocking. But I think for those of us who'd been watching, uh, the ways in which the uh, a certain narrative of of uh, of why 
portions of the United States white population has um, been deprived is because too much attention was being paid to, uh, to, to people who weren't considered the kind of real Americans, um, mm. that that narrative was being fanned by the former occupant of the White House. And that, you know, he, who's now been impeached for the second time. Uh, so it was not shocking um, uh, in the sense that there was a lot of ad advance notice that this kind of drumbeat was being built up. And I, for somebody who's worked, you know, to advance social justice and protect human rights, I think it, it tells us that we have more work to do uh, by turning the lens on ourselves and, and no longer seeing human rights issues as something that is the uh, responsibility of countries thousands of miles from yeah. us. The whole world saw that the U.S. is facing true challenges to, uh, to democracy, ones that go deeper than just that attack on the Capitol have to do with voter suppression, um, and the deep uh, structural inequalities that have. So that's a rather long uh, answer, but I think the short answer is um, those of us who thought this was unthinkable hadn't been paying attention. This was in the works and it was in a way a culmination of a very frightening uh, period of, uh, of US history um, that that we need to pay attention to. I mean, how do you recover from this, um, Mary? Because, I mean, white supremacy is 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 almost embedded, right, um, in in so much of how the world is organized, so much of how the the economy is organized, and of course, like the social determinants of health, you know, issues around water and sanitation, um, you know, uh, uh, having infrastructure you know especially with covid i mean i remember thinking and i've been reading about the issues of flint right and the water issues there and how you know when you look opposite in south africa and johannesburg in the small town of Kwakwa where i come from where people still didn't have access to clean water to wash mm. their hands to mm. cook with and that's such a basic preventative measure for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we speak enough, right, mm -hmm. about how extractive nature of white supremacy and racism is mm -hmm. that leaves people who are already finding themselves in vulnerable situations even more marginalized. So mm -hmm. how do we come out of, mm -hmm. of this space of, of white supremacy and racism? Well, it takes hard work. And it takes more than words, uh, but we've heard some words that give me hope for the first time in history. Uh, in his inaugural address, uh, President Biden used the words white supremacy and used the words uh, that, uh, structural racism, acknowledging that racism is about more than just the individual prejudices. I don't like you, you don't like me, uh, that it's embedded, as you said, um, in, in our societies and the structure of our economy in the cultural norms. Uh, I, and as you point out, uh, the, the, the US had an apartheid-like system uh, that was truly dismantled only in my lifetime uh, in the 1960s when the, um, when the legally dismantled. And of course, to turn, and as you know this very well in South Africa, despite the fact that you have overturned apartheid, you are struggling with enormous inequalities in South Africa. Uh, so it's going to take, um, and, and, and I'm uh, quoting the, um, the head of the Office of the High Commission on Human Rights, who came to my university, to Harvard University, and said, we need to talk about restructuring our economies. So I hope that everybody has the courage and the boldness to realize that we are going to have to make some fundamental changes. And, um, and we might, in a way, see an opening with COVID-19. I told you when we were chatting before we began this event that 
I had just this weekend learned of the death of two of Zimbabwe's leading researchers. They were HIV researchers, James Hakim uh, and David Katzenstein, uh, both died of COVID uh, over, uh, over the weekend. And, you know, we have a vaccine now. Um, we have more in the pipeline and we have hardly any low-income countries. The Director General, Dr. Tedros, said that one in low-income country, unnamed, had administered 25, 25. So the United States has administered over 14 million, but this country had administered 25 uh, COVID vaccines. So South Africa, I believe, is a middle-income country. Are you vaccinating? in South Africa? And what do you think in your role as special rapporteur uh, about how we should be thinking about um, equity and access, not only within countries, but around the world? So unfortunately in South Africa, we haven't started vaccinating. We haven't even received any stock um, of, of vaccines. And there's a lot of secrecy around non-disclosure agreements between pharmaceuticals and governments, which raises a very important question about mm. transparency, trust, and then accountability. Mm. And um, you know, everyone knows the history of this country, right? That maladministration, corruption, especially in the public sector and in the health sector, um, has led you know, to detrimental outcomes and, mm. and negative um, health outcomes. And so there is a distrust generally in the public discourse around the government's capacity and ability um, to handle this vaccine procurement uh, process um, mm. um, with the necessary honesty um, and, and that there will be no looting of state resources that are meant to be, you know, responding to the COVID-19. And, you know, on the 9th of November, um, myself and other United Nations experts released a statement, you know, urging and reminding member states of their obligations in terms of the realization of the right to health, the fact that public health pillars, essential pillars, mm -hmm. are about acceptability, affordability, um, and, and then quality um, of care and, mm -hmm. and affordability. And so with those four principles, it's very important to re reinvigorate the call for health equity because yes, the vaccine is available somewhere, but it's not accessible to everyone who needs it. And affordability becomes an issue where low-income countries and middle-income countries are then further indebted, right, by the developed countries by getting loans and other financial institutions globally who then perpetuate that cycle of poverty where you know, the fiscus and the GDP of countries then go to paying debt it then leaves the issue of quality of care because if healthcare professionals, even at this stage, are unvaccinated, we know they've been the backbone of the primary healthcare system, even before COVID. And just this month, I've lost two of my colleagues that I, I was with at medical school who were doctors mm -hmm. and two of my professors who taught me at medical school. And so the, the loss and, 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 the, and the incredible sense of urgency um, we feel it as citizens and I suppose as those people working in the sector, but I'm not sure that it's trickling and it's, 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 it's hitting the right spot, right. you know, with our leaders. And, 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 and that for me is what makes this whole thing sad. You know, when you look at the fact that South Africa is a middle income country in Sub-Saharan Africa, spends most of the, more of their GDP than any other country in Sub-Saharan Africa on health. And yet our health outcomes are some of the worst. When you look at the granular details of quality of life, you then have some real, real questions that we need to be asking. So the COVID-19 vaccine, the procurement, the planning around who will get vaccinated and who will vaccinate all these people is a big issue for us right now. And I think the secrecy be with the non-disclosure agreements um, is really hampering. And of course, the vaccine hoarding um, that the richer countries have done is not helping anybody because until all of us are, are secure and vaccinated, no country can ever claim to be free and safe. Right. I mean, this is a virus that in just a few months made it to every country in the world. 
So the idea that the wealthy countries could have run successful vaccination campaigns and neglect the rest of the world seems extraordinarily short-sighted. But uh, fortunately, the US has rejoined the World Health Organization and <laughs> has declared its intention to work with its vaccine procurement uh, facility, COVAX. Um, so that's good, that, that, that's really good news. And, um, and but, I, I yeah, wanted go to ahead. ask you something actually, sure. because um, I usually visit New York um, often for the General mm -hmm. Assembly sure. and for the po Commission for the Population Development. And um, I mean, you having worked right as a commissioner of health um, in, in New York City, how, how do you hope that the US will address this pandemic moving forward? I mean, and I note that the President Biden, you know, has rejoined the WHO and has affirmed his support and resourcing of these important institutions. And I remember early on, you know, we were struggling with sexual health information during COVID. And it was actually the New York City Health that led, you know, in terms of um, that early communication around sexual health and sexual mm -hmm. pleasure in the mm -hmm. time of COVID. So what was that like? Um, and what would you like to see, um, you know, going forward? Well, I mean, uh, I, I really hold the New York City Health Department in, in very high regard. And as you point out, uh, the Health Department, uh, e even during COVID, continued to give out information about how people could safely um, and, and how they should consider the organization of their sex lives when mm -hmm. they during a, during this pandemic. And uh, and that was part of um, the, the the city's determination that we should be sex positive. This is part of life, one of the joys in life and, uh, and that um, the kind of um, negative, uh, this might hurt you, kill you stuff wasn't really um, something that young people in particular were really gonna relate to. So I've always been really um, proud of the New York City Health Department, uh, even years ago when the HIV epidemic hit New York very hard. Um, New York was really in many ways the epicenter of the US HIV AIDS uh, epidemic. Uh, the Health Department uh, was truly pioneering in, um, in its work. So um, I'm proud of that work. Um, of course, the, the city is now in, I don't know which wave, um, it was hard hit with uh, COVID-19 early and uh, now um, is in the midst of another wave. And uh, I'll be honest with you, health departments um, from local to state to the federal level have really taken a, a beating um, during, during COVID-19, um, um, uh, you know, with respect to it, their engagement uh, by the political leadership and a willingness to listen to science. Uh, yeah. And this ongoing argument about the economy versus the epidemic, you know, we have to protect the economy and, you know, mm -hmm. as if these aren't just the same thing. How can we protect the economy without tackling without the pandemic? Um, mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that strikes me when I read about human rights, and I've gone totally off script here, so just bear with me, is this <laughs> phrase, um, the indivisibility of rights. Yeah. And the, you know, the idea that these are rights to which we each have, um, have, the, have the right to by virtue of being human, uh, that we don't have to, do anything except be born um, to uh, feel that we have a claim on these rights and that the rights are indivisible. Um, can you just say how you think about that? And it seems to me that really is a, a call for the idea of the social determinants of health, that we need all of these rights, that there's no such thing as the right to health without the right to safety. Uh, without the right to decent work, uh, and so on. Without even yeah, the right to leisure on. and rest, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you are so right, Mary, because, um, I mean, when I applied to be special repertoire, you know, I had my own ideas and, and, and all of those, and I've refined them to really three important things. Mm. 
is that we have to decolonize and democratize global health. Mm. We have to be anti-racist mm. and we have to employ intersectional frameworks for the future oh. and the vision of the world that we want. Good for you. If, if that, that will be <laughs> the thread of my entire term. Mm. And, and it's precisely because of what you are talking about, mm. um, how the right to health is interlinked and mm. indivisible to other human rights. Um, and I'll, you know, I, I spoke a little bit about the, the right to water and sanitation and how it was even more of an urgency in the time of COVID for those um, communities who do not have um, access to safe and portable water and adequate san sanitation. But we can also talk about healthy occupational and environmental conditions, right? Essential workers are not only healthcare providers. We have people in hospitality, services industries who are delivering our food so we can stay safe and quarantined. Mm -hmm. And the other important part, which is something that I am an expert in, is the issue of sexual and reproductive health. The fact that not just access to the service, but access to the education as well as information because that enables you to make informed consent. And that is the space we need to be moving at in. It's about respecting autonomy. It's about respecting dignity and offering dignified care. And you can't do that if patients or citizens do not know their rights, right? right? And so in my approach to the mandate is to really look specifically into those entitlements, such as maternal and child and reproductive health looking at issues of bodily integrity, freedom from torture and ill treatment. I mean, we know the history of medicine, mm -hmm. all the different experimentation and unethical mm -hmm. practices that has happened mm -hmm. in, in, in the medical fraternity. In South Africa last year, the Commission for Gender Equality, where I'm a commissioner, released a report that detailed some horrible um, you know, treatment of HIV positive women who were either coerced or forced into, into sterilization because they were HIV positive. And this is not something that happened in the 80s. It happened in the democratic South Africa. And so those are the very important issues for me um, to really constantly be drawing the links and showing that in fact, my right to grow up as a child in a safe and secure environment is important for my mental health. It's also important for me and my cognitive development and, 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 and so the issue of gender-based violence for me and femicide, I always think, who else are we leaving behind when we are talking about gender-based violence? Because again, in South Africa, you have women mm. who are raped, mm. but some of them are raped because they are women and lesbian. So their sexuality becomes mm. a second layer of vulnerability mm. that they then have to navigate in, mm. their, in their communities. And so it really is about not just defining the right to health in abstract terms, but really thinking about how do we operationalize human rights? How do we operationalize the right to health that it's the bedrock of all policy work, all policy analysis, and as well as clinical care. A lot of my colleagues and, 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 and people generally, um, you know, struggle with this um, idea of, of, of being a doctor, but also being an activist. And I always explain it very clearly. When you are in the consultation room with your patient one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. you are already advocating for their rights. You are already promoting their rights to human rights. And, and in some instances, you will go further to develop and advance and do all of those things related to human rights. And the only difference with me is that I'm a clinician who's doing that broadly, not one-on-one -on -one anymore, but more broadly. Um, and this year, of course, I have gone back to clinical practice. So it really? will be quite interesting for me. Yes, yes. Right, you've uh, answered much, the call. I'll be back. Wow. <laughs> yes, I'll be back in clinical practice. But again, I think for me, it is about creating better health systems that can better um, um, support and respect and protect people's human rights, even in the clinical care and how we practice medicine in itself should be about human rights. Wow, that was beautiful. Uh, can you just, for all of us, just say once more <laughs> the three main themes that you decided to highlight in your role as a special rapporteur? And then tell us a little bit about what special rapporteurs do and what you do in a time of COVID. 
when I would have guessed that your ability <laughs> to go around the world has been constrained. Yeah, yes. And you're doing more of this kind of visiting here. I'm talking to you from uh, snow clad uh, Boston, <laughs> and, um, but uh, you, you, uh, you can't come here at the moment. Yeah. So tell us those and three things. And it's such a special place. Again. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do have some friends that I went to high school with who are currently at Harvard. Really, um, and so this is a yes. Yeah. It's, it's more yeah. of a, a you world. know intimate fireside <laughs> chat. I think. <laughs> um, so the, the special repertoire, um, you know, is mandated to pay attention to groups of mm. people in vulnerable or marginalized situations, and we are tasked with applying a gender lens to the work that we do and addressing, of course, the needs of children in the realization of the right to health. It's very important that um, we have to take into account, of course, the other important work of other UN agencies and programs like UNAIDS, like UNFPA, amplifying the work that they do, um, and the WHO, of course. And as a special repertoire, without COVID, I would have probably done a few country visits now where you do fact-finding missions, mm -hmm. where you investigate um, alleged allegations of abuse or ongoing mm -hmm. allegations of abuse. Um, also what's important is to identify trends and advise the United Nations of any trends that are emerging that are related to the right to health. Um, and of course, it's important um, that we, we, we foster dialogue. And this is why this chat with you and me this mm -hmm. evening is so important um, because if I will succeed in that thread, right, of decolonizing and de de democratizing global health and being anti-racist and employing intersectional frameworks, I will need support. I will need thought leadership. I will need scholars um, who can support this work um, and, and, and my mandate in the manner that we are trying to move it. Um, because I know, you know, a lot of the spaces we've often heard about, um, you know, decolonization, but what does mm -hmm. it actually mean? And these dialogues are important to start there, uh, Mary, because we know the distrust that Black populations and Indigenous people and people of color communities have with a distrust of vaccine. It's not just because they're anti-vaxxers. There is a serious, serious, deep-seated distrust of medicine because of the history of medicine. So for me, it's about bringing that thread to then interrogate the different aspects of public health and the right to health. Right. Well, I want to say that all three of your priorities really have have meaning right here in this country. So I can't be the person who invites you. I don't know who how you get to visit, but I think that you you would uh, we would do well to have you come um, and visit the United States with a with a view on its right to health. Uh, mm -hmm. We are um, unique among wealthy nations and not having universal access to health care. We still have 29 million people who lack, um, who lack health insurance coverage. And of course, as you point out, we also share a legacy of abuse and, and everyday disrespectful treatment, which makes people not want to engage with our, our healthcare system. We, um, we had a doctor uh, who was sick with COVID and was asking uh, for certain types of treatment. And the doctor who saw her became so enraged. She was a medical doctor herself that he threatened her with discharge, for example. Uh, so anyway, there would be plenty of things to, to find here. Um, I, I wanna, I, I think our time is probably wrapping up, but uh, and we want to have time for questions. But I want to come back to what you've talked about as the idea of a doctor and as somebody who has had many years of training, who's studied basic sciences, and the idea of being an activist. You know, when I think about um, the fact that COVID-19 is not just about one person confronting this novel virus, that we're not just talking about the battle of an individual and a virus, that who gets sick, uh, who uh, may die, uh, is formed by many other factors than just thinking about that individual alone. Well, that's not really uh, outside of the realm of science. Th this is fact. 
uh, that when we talk about our patients, they, we have to think about the real world that they encounter and what helps them be healthy or not. So I think of that not really as advocacy, but as doing our job. And it's, but it, you're right. Everybody always says, oh, you know, she's so interested in all these social <laughs> things, you know. Uh, but I consider that part of doing our job. So I suppose that we um, uh, should turn to letting people ask us questions if there are any. I'm happy to keep talking with you. Um, yeah, I wonder- some in the q and A. Are there? Are, are we yeah. supposed to look at them? Our, ourselves, let's see. So uh, uh, Dr. Megan Daly is going to moderate the Q&A. Okay, for okay, so I'll okay, turn it over Megan. To her. okay great. All right, <laughs> I wanna thank you for a really, that's really felt like a fireside chat. So thank you. <laughs> thank for you, our, Mary, this has been so lovely us. for me. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Stay with us, we wanna hear your questions. Yes, and just moving on to some of our audience questions, we'll open with one from Benjamin Meyer who states the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the weakness of welfare systems to support vulnerable populations during periods of extended lockdown measures. How can human rights, especially the economic and social rights that underlie public health, shape the fulfillment of basic needs during periods of physical distancing? So that's, that's a big one here. <laughs> it is a big one. That's a big one. Um, and, and I mean, this was one of the biggest frustrations for me in South Africa during our really hard level five lockdown um, is that the people who, who are health workers are still predominantly women and people who are in services, hospitality and who are classified as essential workers again are women. And it's women who are underpaid, who don't have labor protections, who can't take sick leave um, and who again are still the same people who are charged with with chores and taking care of extended family. And unless we even include the workplace and what are the responsibilities, right, of, 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 of the economy and, 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 and the, the infrastructure that enables just rights abuses to be normalized. Because the problem that you found with COVID and the lack of social support is because there's no planning there's no emergency, emergency reserves. And citizens are always told that we must have, you know, three months savings of your salary for a rainy day. And yet in my country, South Africa, there were more protections for businesses than there were for, for citizens. And so it, it asks a bigger question about what kind of societies do we live in? And the entire time, my call was always, we have to save the humans first. Because without the humans, there is no economy. There is no economy. So my outlook is really about putting people first, but it's difficult to put people first in a time of disaster when as a default setting, those are not your principles, you know? Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's really, really frustrating um, that indeed, and you found that those countries that were able to succeed in giving social support, citizens were, um, able to social distance um, properly, and 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 you know, and and that led, of course, that behavior itself led to a lesser um, spreading of the of the infection. Well, for the United States, a very wealthy country, uh, I, my position was always that that the U.S. should have opened the coffers uh, and kept people afloat, and we saw the you know this sort of. Uh, we can afford it. The United States can afford it, and it should have met its obligations to to the world uh, and help mm. and helped uh, uh, countries that that don't have the kind of resources that the United States did. Yeah. So this was the time to um, to to say that the no, the the cost is not too high, um, but that wasn't what we saw, and mm. um, uh, you know we now. Um, you know, we, we're paying a price for it um, compared to Europe, which has a much stronger social safety net than the United States. Yeah. Um, you know, the quote lockdown was far more successful there. I think the estimates are that the US hit sort of about 50%, whereas mm -hmm. mobile phone data and so on suggested that in, um, in Europe, they'd really damp things down 80%, that kind of thing yeah. really, 
Um, and, and that was what reduced the circulation of a virus. This is a highly contagious virus. And uh, when people are out there mixing, uh, we have seen uh, the virus will spread again. And so um, we're, we're paying a price uh, for not having effectively pursued these very stringent measures before. And in a country like South Africa, I wonder, I mean, when people have no food, are they really going to stay in their house and starve? I... Yeah, and the policing, right, of wow. the lockdown was, of course, onto Black people and mm -hmm. Black townships, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, there's a photo that, you know, is etched in my mind of an elderly woman with just a bucket of, um, you know, cupcakes, just mm -hmm. trying to sell a few so she can get, you know, money to go Good buy money. food. Mm -hmm. And, 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 our default setting is that we already have so many people who are experiencing food insecurity, who are experiencing homelessness, that the one thing COVID did was highlight how deeply flawed the system was. But the issues that are now being brought forward by COVID, unfortunately in countries like ours are not new. They have been neglected all along. And so COVID finds us already in a fractured public health system, it finds us in a place where we are unable to efficiently provide social support for your elderly people and children and people with disabilities. Even at our best, we were already struggling. So people are experiencing hunger, people are experiencing starvation, children are experiencing stunting in growth, and the older people have no mental support whatsoever including children. It's so hard to talk about children and explain what's happening. So if as adults, we are feeling so overwhelmed, can you imagine a child who still can't even process and find the, the articulation of the feelings that they feel? And I think the mental health side of, of the COVID response is something that we are not paying enough attention to. And the fact that communities are experiencing COVID at the back of living under really terrible um, situations in the first place. Yeah, it's, uh, this will take a while to get through. Uh, Thank you uh, both. I think we can uh, move on to another question if that works for you. We'll take one from Elise Pector who asks, essential workers were just moved down on the list for vaccination for COVID-19 in phase two in Massachusetts. Do you see this as a continuing denigration of the rights of and protection for black and brown people? I think that that question must be directed mostly to me. I, I, uh, so let me take it and, and you can say what the um, analogies might be in, in the settings that you're more familiar with, Dr. Mofa King. So the, um, the metric that's being used to assess who should have access to the vaccine first is saving lives. And the majority of people who have died of COVID-19 are older people. And the, something like an aggregate, 80% of all deaths that have happened so far were among people who were over the age of 65. Uh, but of course, uh, getting to be old is not, um, is not something that is guaranteed for everyone. And the proportion of deaths that have occurred beyond the age of 65 varies a lot in the United States by race, ethnicity, something close to 90% of whites have, uh, uh, who have died of COVID-19 were over the age of 65 when they died. And that proportion is more like 70% for blacks and um, for uh, La the Latinx population, it's uh, even closer to 60%. So this is a source of great worry to me. That means that um, for non-white populations, uh, black and brown populations, and uh, the, their much larger proportion of people are, who will get sick and die of COVID-19 are not, not vaccine eligible on the basis of age. Uh, but the um, goal of saving lives is uh, probably still best served, but it may be a kind of a short-sighted view of uh, how you save lives. You have to also tamp down the virus. You have to reduce transmission. Those elders get infected by somebody. 
um, and they may be at home being infected by a household member who is an essential worker. So protecting that person from infection um, is important, I believe. So there is no doubt that, um, that using age alone uh, will result in, in racial inequities. And then there are other inequities that have to do with vaccine access. I was just looking at a map for Massachusetts and the, you know, the placement of vaccine facilities and they're gonna be more opening up. It doesn't look particularly equitable in terms of access, uh, physical access by um, the traditionally black and brown communities of, of the city. Um, this is of course a city that has segregated neighborhoods and a history of residential segregation. So yes, uh, we all have to keep vigilant on, um, on how the vaccine is being delivered. Uh, my sister in New York, just to reduce to anecdote, um, told me that when she went with my mother who is 92 um, to get a vaccination, that the people leaving the vaccine facility, which was in a neighborhood that's black and Latin, Latino, all looked like they were coming from the opera. They were driving BMWs and Volvos and they were not people from the neighborhood. So this is a problem. We have to demand data uh, that helps us to track this and have to um, work to ensure availability as well as trustworthiness in uh, vaccine access in the United States. Trustworthiness of institutions that, yeah. So uh, that's my answer. I don't know if you want to come in on it, Dr. Mofa Kang, but we really already no, 12, well. 12 states one have, <laughs> yeah, 12 states, um, the Kellogg, uh, no, it was Kaiser Family Foundation has released data from 12 states that have race specific data on vaccine, um, on vaccinations, which of course that's what will protect us, not having the vaccine sort of around, it's vaccines, administered that will protect us. Mm -hmm. And huge uh, racial disparities are already emerging. I don't want this to be attributed to vaccine hesitancy or vaccine resistance when we still have real problems with convenience and access. That has to be fixed. And at the same time that we work to ensure people that the vaccine is safe and effective mm -hmm. to assure people. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think since um, we're almost out of time, we could just end on one last question for both of you. Actually, um, Dr. Mokofing, I believe this one might be geared a little bit more towards you for an answer. Um, this one is from our audience member, Coletso, who writes, how do we do anti-racist work through the UN when the system itself is structurally racist? For example, security council membership. Mm, that's a good one. And I think it takes all of us, right? Because we are not always going to be up for the fight at the same time. I'm up for it now. I put my hand up to be special rapporteur on the right to health. And it means we all have to support that mandate and what it means for all of us. Um, because next time it may be someone else who's working on issues of culture. It may be someone else working on racism. And we have to realize that this beast is huge, right? If you think about racism globally, it's embedded in the laws. So when people use the law against you, um, they are basically just you, you know, perpetuating white supremacy, but they can always hide behind the law. So we need legal practitioners, we need advocates, we need attorneys who are themselves understanding how in their practice of the law, they can be anti-racist and support democratization. And the same with the United Nations. The issue that the interns don't get paid, um, you know, they, 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 it, it means then it's only those people who are from families who can support them being interns and, and working for free. And mm -hmm. therefore they are the ones who are most likely to get a foot in the system and then remain in the system. And so I, I fully agree that um, not all of us will have the capacity all the time because racism has literal physical health, you know, negative outcomes. So it's not easy to just constantly be fighting, but it's about how do we advocate? How are we strategic? How do we amplify each other's voices? And how do we, how do we hold states accountable for the right to health 
um, violations or rights abuses that they, they may experience. And, and of course, we know um, that the covenant on um, social, economic, and cultural rights of the UN gives states, even at the national level, certain obligations. So it's very important for us to know what those obligations are and report to the UN and to the special mandate holders specifically for that issue and try and galvanize and use them to support your advocacy within and without the outside of the UN. Thank you. Dr. Thank you so much. And Dr. Bassett, just to end on that similar note, is there any experience that you would like to comment on along this line, um, just drawing on your experience in government in both the private and public sector, anything you'd like to add along this line? You mean on how we build an anti-racist movement? Well, this is a job for all of us, uh, I would say. And part of it is just not shutting up. And I, I think Dr. Mofa King has, uh, she is uh, really courageously put her hand up. I don't know any other special rapporteur for health who's highlighted decolonization, anti-racism and taking an intersectional lens to her work. Uh, this is, a, this is a pioneering. So I do believe that the words count. I believe that uh, calling and challenging uh, the institutions uh, because, um, you know, structural racism is embedded. And so it won't be quickly changed. It's not something um, that changing the kind of world order will automatically occur because we find it unfair. Uh, but I believe that all of us are in a time when we are witnessing a shift in the world order. Uh, that the kind of dispensation uh, that uh, was led only by the, the West and the United States is ending. Uh, and we are seeing countries like South Africa align themselves with, I can't remember the acronym for those nations. Uh, so we're seeing different, um, so uh, uh, we're seeing different alignments occurring. And I think, uh, raising the point that the impact of the colonial legacy is still with us, that the white supremacy that justified it, enabled it, is still with us, and that it affects all aspects of our lives. So I want to think, I think that we might be close to wrapping up or we have, may have gone over a few minutes. Um, so I just want to give thanks for a robust discussion and turn it back to our moderators to close us out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bassett and Dr. Mofo King for a wonderful discussion today. Unfortunately, we are out of time for the program. Um, we apologize to anyone whose question we weren't able to get to today, but we would like to thank you all very much for watching. And if you are interested in learning more about the FXC Center for Health and Human Rights or learning more about our upcoming events, please visit fxc.harvard.edu. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>